For Beatles fans, 1982 was a memorable but expensive year. When you combine Beatles and solo releases that year, there were eight 7-inch singles, three 12-inch singles, six albums, two LP box sets, one singles box set, and a video cassette. In this, our second video about this year, with the help of these amazing scrapbooks, we cover every twist and turn in the frantic final four months of that unforgettable 20th anniversary year. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and who cares if you miss the 1960s? This is 1982. Whether you liked it or not, The Sun was Britain's biggest selling newspaper in 1982. And if they printed something on their front page, it got noticed and everybody talked about it. And for the week beginning September the 20th, 1982, it was Beatles Week in The Sun, which meant a series of salacious stories and, of course, Beatle birds. OK, you get the idea. Despite its unkind-sounding title, the first article of the week portrayed Paul as a modest, down-to-earth sort of chap who enjoyed wearing second-hand clothes and liked a cheap trim at the local barber's. In essence, it paints him as someone who tries to lead a normal life, but the world won't let him. Sightings of George in late 1982 were few and far between, as the following day's article entitled The Secret World of Gentle George found out. The secret world was, of course, Friar Park, his 36-acre estate in Henley-on-Thames, where he spent most of his time gardening, being with his family, and enjoying the company of a close circle of friends. One of which was the racing driver Jackie Stewart, who explained to the paper that George was a man who'd now come to terms with himself and is happy being left alone to tend to his garden. The article was unfortunately spoiled by some negative quotes from Philip Norman, author of the book Shout, who was always happy to have a dig at George. The following day, it was Ringo's turn to be in the firing line, but the criticism this time came from closer to home, his son, Zach. Being Ringo's son is a total pain, complained Zach, and was, he went on, the biggest drag in my life. Determined to get out from his father's shadow, he was throwing all his energy into playing the drums like his hero, Keith Moon, and had an ambition to become famous as a great drummer, not as Ringo's son, which I think he certainly achieved. Radio one. On September the 24th, Linda McCartney celebrated her 40th birthday with the launch of a new book called Photographs. Of course, Paul was there to support her at the launch party in London, and here they are pictured together at that event in an article which celebrated their 13 years together. Later that evening, Paul was pictured with fellow EMI legend Cliff Richard at Abbey Road Studios at a party to celebrate the launch of the Guinness Book of 500 number one hits. The headline of the article was, How on earth could they look so young at 40? Although Cliff was at this point 42. On September the 25th, there finally came the confirmation that EMI were re-releasing Love Me Do on October the 4th. Not only would the record retain its original red label, it would also be available as a limited edition picture disc. It was also reported that a Beatles compilation album was being prepared for release later in October. On the same day as that announcement came the news that, at last, the fifth Beatle was to break his 20-year silence. So over the next two weekends in Britain's muckiest Sunday newspaper, The News of the World, Pete Best dished out all the dirt he could remember about his time with the Beatles. £15 a week plus an orgy every night was the headline of the first instalment in which Pete recalled how he joined the Beatles. He also opened up about their antics in Hamburg with stories of poverty, pills, punch-ups and petty crime, followed by a suicide bid. But this was all just a distraction from the main event, the Beatles' 20th anniversary. Radio One, Newsbeat. The celebrations were kicked off by the Daily Mirror on September the 28th. In this article, which showed off some never-before-published shots from photographer Dezo Hoffman's private collection. 
Of more interest to us today was the article beneath it, which was written by William Marshall, a journalist who'd known the group since the early days and who'd co-authored Alan Williams' excellent book, The Man Who Gave the Beatles Away, in 1975. If you'd like to read this article, or indeed any of the other ones in the video, just pause the video and pinch and zoom in. The resolution should be high enough for you to read it. More small-time revelations appeared in the Sunday Mirror on October the 3rd, this time under the headline, The Stars, Untold Secrets of the Beatles. This consisted of stories recounted by minor celebrities of the day who had, at some point in their dim and distant past, brushed shoulders with the group. Among them was actor Lewis Collins, best known then for his role as Bodie in ITV's action show The Professionals. Collins explains how he'd been working in a hairdressing salon at the same time as Ringo was filmed visiting there. Also, being a friend of Paul's brother Mike, he recalled how he'd watched Paul become irritated while listening to an acetate of She Loves You on a clapped out record player in his carpet slippers at his house. Journalist and fellow ex-musician Bernard Falk contributed a story where he recalled Ringo's first appearance at the Cavern. Whilst comedian Freddie Starr boasted that Brian Epstein had fancied him. Solid Gold Radio 1 Love Me Do was reissued the following day by EMI in a brand new picture sleeve and with, as promised, its original red parlophone label. Aside from the word mono, the only other major change was that the label now carried Paul's MPL publishing credit. This cutting from October the 12th reported that Paul had managed to buy the publishing for Love Me Do and was hoping to buy up the rest of the Beatles catalogue from Lou Grade, something which we know did not go according to plan. Upon hearing the Love Me Do single, the NME, like some ardent Beatles fans, noticed that the version of the song on the record was different to the one which had originally appeared in 1962. But that detail didn't seem to bother the British record buying public, who helped it easily beat its original chart placing of number 17 and send it flying up the charts to number four. Everyone, including myself, was thrilled by the success of Love Me Do. The only person who wasn't was the drummer on the record, session musician Andy White, who let it be known that he received only seven pounds for the session, but admitted it seemed like a fortune at the time. On the same day as Love Me Do's release, The Sun reported on how the outrageous and ridiculous suggestion that Paul McCartney had died in 1966 and had been replaced by a double was being explored by an American writer called Joe Glazier. He claimed to have proof and photographs which showed the difference between the old and new pools, which, as the paper suggested, was all nonsense, of course, but high-class nonsense. It's National Radio One. With money from a paper round as my only income in late 1982, the next Beatles release was something I could only dream about owning, which was... This. It's the Beatles Mono Collection box set. It comprised the Beatles' 10 studio albums, which had been released in mono in the UK, from Please Please Me to The White Album. EMI reportedly pressed 10,000 copies of each album, all of which had been available separately since June 1981. But faced with increasing demand for Beatles product and an upcoming anniversary, putting them together in a box set was a no-brainer. Now, sets which were sold in the UK came in these red boxes and bore the catalogue number BMC10. However, a further 1,000 sets were put together inside black boxes, which carried the catalogue number BM1. These individually numbered, certificated examples were produced specifically for export to the US. Despite the higher quality of finish of the more recent 2014 mono set, these boxes remain highly prized by collectors and audiophiles, and you'd expect to pay around $1,500 for a mint one today. And that's mainly because of the authenticity of the mono sound on these discs, which were pressed either using the original 1960s stampers or were recut by Harry Moss, the man who'd cut the originals. 
The only negative point against this set is that some contain a mispressed Sgt. Pepper album, which has a stereo side too. Another set making its debut at this time was the US Mobile Fidelity or MFSL Beatles Collection box set. This 14 disc half speed mastered set was available on import in the UK for a cool £299, which although seems like pretty good value, actually works out at around £1,200 in today's money. If you'd like to know more about those box sets, you can watch dedicated videos about them both elsewhere on the channel. Links are in the description. This story from the Daily Star from October the 18th gave the public its first glimpse of Paul's next major project. As it reported, he was preparing to star in his own film called Give My Regards to Broad Street. This news, also carried in other tabloids that day, reported that the already written film about a fictional day in his life would feature a 30-strong cast, including Linda, Ringo and Eric Stewart, and would include music by Wings and the Beatles. A week later, the NME revealed that shooting had already begun on the one and a half million pound budget film. Filming was, it said, expected to be completed by Christmas and the premiere was planned for the spring, along with an accompanying soundtrack album. There will, of course, be much more on this subject later on in this series. October the 18th saw the release of the Beatles' 20 Greatest Hits. Originally planned as a TV advertised 26 track double album, this was the first official hits compilation to be released in the UK since the Red and the Blue albums back in 1973, which incidentally were still selling well. In what turned out to be the last time, Capital created their own version, where they dropped From Me To You, Day Tripper, Eleanor Rigby, Yellow Submarine, Lady Madonna, and The Ballad of John and Yoko, and added Yesterday, Penny Lane, Come Together, Let It Be, and The Long and Winding Road. They also lopped off two minutes of Hey Jude, just for good measure. The album didn't do as well as EMI had anticipated. Its boring cover art and uninspired track selection were certainly two reasons for that. In fact, WH Smiths in the UK were so overstocked they were giving away copies free with videos of The Complete Beatles. Now, before I saw this ad, I'd forgotten just how expensive pre-recorded videos were back then. The Complete Beatles video cassette was retailing for £34.95. pence. That's well over £100 in today's money. And those feature films listed below were £10 more which is getting on towards £150. Released back in May, The Complete Beatles was a well-received two-hour documentary about the group, notable for its Malcolm McDowell narration and rare clips of the Beatles recording in Abbey Road. Despite its relatively high cost, it was a big seller on all the home video formats of the day. That is, until Paul McCartney bought the rights to it in the run-up to the Beatles anthology. Since then, it hasn't and probably won't ever see the light of day again. Radio One. Paul, Linda and James were pictured out shopping on October the 21st, the same day as Paul appeared in another story in the Daily Mail, where he voiced his fears about children and drugs. But it was his openness and admission about taking LSD and marijuana that would come back to bite him in the tabloids a few years later. On October the 22nd, the papers reported that Yoko had ended her association with David Geffen and had signed a long-term deal with Polygram and their Polydor label and was busy preparing for the release of a new album called It's All Right. It's an album of love and dreams, Yoko told the NME, and added, I'm hoping through dreaming together, we will create a beautiful reality for the future. The article also reported that Julian had recorded two of his father's songs, 
Stepping Out and Ein Zwei Hickel Fickel, which was how John had counted in the track I Don't Wanna Face It, both of which appeared on Milk and Honey two years later. Eleven days after the release of the Beatles' 20 Greatest Hits came the release of Paul's duet with Michael Jackson on the single The Girl Is Mine, released on Jackson's label Epic. Predictably, music paper reviewers were not impressed. The NME called it another black and white minstrel show and a truly glutinous mix that will sell like hot chocolate cake. It also mocked its soaring strings, cloying lyrics and embarrassing mock antagonism. An opinion for once, I agree with. On October the 30th, the NME announced that three more Beatles-related albums were due for release the following month. First up on November the 1st was the John Lennon Collection, a career-spanning 17-track album put together by Yoko and David Geffen, which covered his post-Beatles career on both Apple and Geffen. It was a massive seller, shifting 300,000 copies in its first week in the UK, and by the end of the month, it had sold a million. But the only thing the NME found compelling about the album was its cover. On November the 15th, EMI chose to release a single from the album, which was this, Love, backed with Give Me Some Truth. The version of Love on here is actually a unique mix, which removed the fade in and fade out, and is to my knowledge unique to this 45, and unavailable anywhere else. As I mentioned earlier, it had been noticed in the press that the version of Love Me Do on the new single was not the version which had originally appeared in October 1962. So on the same day as they released the John Lennon collection, EMI released a 12-inch of Love Me Do, which contained the original Ringo on drums version of the track. EMI blamed a factory error for not including it in the first place, but not to worry because they had now discovered the missing master. But as we now know, the master had been junked in the 1960s, and the version released on the 12-inch, although correct, was dubbed from an original copy of the disc. Curiously, EMI was to make exactly the same mistake when they issued the single once more for its 50th anniversary in 2012. You can find out more about that and the history of Love Me Do in our dedicated video about the song elsewhere on the channel, a link to which of course is in the description. As we saw in part one, George, unlike Paul, had little interest or indeed any liking for the contemporary music scene. More interested in his passions for gardening and Formula One motor racing, he refused to do any promotion for his new album, Gone Troppo, which was released on November the 8th. Gone Troppo is an Australian slang expression meaning gone mad due to tropical heat and was something which George had picked up whilst visiting the country earlier that year and was just what many fans thought he had done. His failure to promote the album, along with its bizarre cover full of in-jokes and surreal images, meant it sank without trace in the UK. Described by one critic as amiable light-hearted music made by a bunch of mates with nothing to prove, it was just the style of music George was happy making at this point, and was one which would eventually bring him commercial success a few years later with the Travelling Wilburys. For those of you wondering what Ringo was getting up to at this point, it was mostly trouble. For if Ringo was in the press, it was usually for all the wrong reasons. For example, in November, Rick Wakeman had been recording at Ringo's studio in Tiddenhurst Park in Ascot and mistakenly opened a wrong door and was viciously attacked by Ringo's two Alsatian dogs. After which, Wakeman was spotted running from the house shouting, I'm suing. But Ringo assured people that the rejected police dogs were lovely, once they get to know you. The press had it in for him again a few weeks later, when he was branded mean in more than one tabloid. They reported that he'd applied for a council grant to cure dry rot in his stables at Sunningdale and another to restore statues at Ascot. Well, he has a legal right to apply for a grant, said councillor Jack Jarrett but it makes him look like a real old meanie and Scrooge. 
Conservative Planning Committee member Brian Campbell agreed, saying, I object most strongly because ratepayers' hard-earned cash should not be handed over to wealthy pop stars. On November the 7th, the Sunday People reported on the discovery of a roll of film in a junk shop by a bargain hunter named Eric Lloyd. His story was that he'd stumbled across a black doctor's bag containing some rolls of film, and one turned out to contain shots of the Beatles in Florida in February 1964. Nice one, Eric. November 9th saw Paul pictured in the back streets of Bermondsey, South London, as filming began on Give My Regards to Broad Street. Meanwhile, Yoko was busy, not just preparing for the release of a new album, but was also getting ready to marry again. The lucky man was interior designer Sam Habitoy, whom she'd met while he was decorating at the Dakota. The wedding is definitely on, a close friend was quoted saying, but of course, it wasn't. British journalist and old friend of John's, Ray Coleman, caught up with Yoko in this Daily Mirror article from November the 22nd, but there was no mention of any wedding, just the usual chat about security, sorrow and Sean. December the 6th saw the release of a new box set called the Beatles Singles Collection. Housed in a box similar in style to that of its LP cousin BC-13, this was basically a repackage of the 1976 set containing all of the standard 22 singles but in newly designed picture sleeves. Plus the singles which have been released since Back in the USSR, Sgt Peppers and Movie Medley. Some copies even came with a Love Me Do picture disc. This clipping from the Daily Mirror from December the 9th brought back all the memories of the events two years earlier, in which Yoko, still only 49, confessed once more to living in constant fear for both herself and Sean, who was finding comfort in his latest toy, Pac-Man. The Daily Star carried a similar article, but this time with more haunting pictures. Yoko's It's All Right album was sympathetically reviewed in the NME on December the 18th. But what do you think? Have you heard it? Drop me a line in the comments with your review. On December the 22nd, Sotheby's held what was fast becoming a popular annual event, their rock and roll memorabilia sale. This year, the sale attracted an unusual bidder, Bill Wyman, who ended up buying some signed Beatles pictures for £130 as well as the first 25 editions of the Rolling Stones magazine for £140. The year ended as it had begun with BBC documentaries. First was an appreciation of Paul McCartney by Paul Gambaccini, followed by a documentary about Abbey Road, presented by Radio 1 breakfast show DJ Mike Reed. And so ended an incredible and expensive year. I'd love to know what your memories are of it and what records you bought in 1982. So do let me and everyone else know in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, do consider becoming a channel member or hitting the thanks button. Every little helps to keep the channel going. Also, if you'd like to buy some quality vintage Beatles and 60s vinyl, check out our website, parlogramauctions.com. The Scrapbook series will be back again soon so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on that. I'll be back next week with something else, but right now I'm done. So I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.